GLF's Brave New World welcomes you back to our second session of the day. Those of you who missed our earlier session, A Burning, Writing and Resistance, with Megha, Megha Majumdar and in conversation with Mansi Subramaniam, and all of the other sessions, including Oran Pamuk, Chumpa Lahiri, Professor Bijit Banerjee and Esther Duflo, Venki Ramakrishnan, Brakhadat, Neil Ferguson, Dr. Amri Sathwik and Dr. Siddharth Mukherjee. You can catch these on our Facebook page, GLF Lit Fest or on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Lit Fest JLF. Our official radio partner is Red FM Bajate Raho. Our next session is Chinese Whispers, Dotam Bambabale and Suhasini Haider in conversation. Given the buildup on the line of control between India and China, this is one conversation that's bound to make news. Former ambassador to China, Gautam Bambabale, and the national editor and diplomatic affairs editor of the Hindu Suhasini Haider speak of India-China equations in terms of history and geopolitics and examine the changing posture and calibrated aggression of the Chinese dream, or should we say, the Chinese dragon. Ambassador Gautam Bambable was formerly ambassador to Bhutan, Pakistan, and China. He is currently distinguished professor, faculty of humanities and social sciences, Symbiosis International University in Pune, He's also a senior advisor for the Ola Group. So Hasini Haider, as all of you know, is the diplomatic and national editor at The Hindu. She writes regularly on India's foreign policy and has contributed to several books on the subject. Please do remember to comment and ask questions by typing it into the comment section below. And in case any of you drop off due to bandwidth issues, you can find us on our YouTube channel, Jaipur Litfest JLF, and of course, if we drop off, hang in there, we'll be right back. Ladies and gentlemen, Chinese whispers, Gautam Bambabale and Suhasini Haider in conversation. Suhasini, over to you. Thanks so much, Sanjay. And as always, it's a pleasure to be here on, uh, uh, on these JLF uh, uh, conversations that we've been trying to hold uh, uh, through this entire period. And it's been... Uh, uh, you know, one thing after another, but I'm very pleased to welcome Ambassador Bambawale, somebody uh, whom we've seen handle some of the most dis difficult, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, diplomatic situations of the time. Ambassador Bambawale, as of today, and I say this with emphasis because just yesterday, the Ministry of External Affairs finally came out and made it clear that in fact, Chinese troops have been amassing along the LAC since early May. So we're looking at a standoff that is nearly two months, uh, or at least uh, nearly two months in age. Um, and I say this without trying to be dramatic, because you know, with India-China relations, one wants to not be dramatic. But we are in uncharted territory. 45 years since the last casualties of this kind at the LAC between Indian and Chinese troops. Uh, a situation where I might say every agreement, every protocol, particularly the 1993 protocol that had decided how Indian and Chinese troops would be able to maintain peace and tranquility as it was known on the line of actual control. All of that, that's 27 years old, all of that has been cast aside. Um, and yet we see the two sides still talking. We see the external affairs minister take part in talks uh, along with Russia and the Chinese foreign minister discuss other issues. Uh, we are here, diplomatic parlays are happening. Military commanders are meeting and discussing disengagement. Um, so my first question to you would really be, are we looking right now at the beginning of the end of this standoff or is this really just the end of the beginning? Uh, that's a very interesting and an excellent question, uh, Suhasini, and I, don't know if anyone in India, at least, and possibly no one in China either, has an answer to that question. But you are not wrong in your opening remarks, in your initial remarks, you did mention that one of the things which is different on the LAC this time is the fact that there are huge numbers of troops mass massed on both sides. And this is different from the past when stray patrols of maybe 30, 40 soldiers would come across each other and um, uh, would be in close proximity to each other. And therefore, obviously, the conclusion that many in India have drawn and which is absolutely correct is that this is not 
something accidental it is something which has been planned is premeditated and there's absolutely no doubt about that the question that all of us are asking is why are the chinese doing this what are their motivations and i would say that what they're trying to do on the ground is to move their actual ground positions where their troops are right up till their idea their conception of what the lac is and therefore uh, uh, they they realized that where india china relations are concerned where this whole architecture of peace and tranquility is concerned uh, which as you rightly said has been built up from the 1993 agreement and many agreements thereafter uh, that one of the crucial and critical things there is not to change the status quo on the ground this time round the chinese have changed the status quo on the ground and therefore i would say that they are responsible for everything that's happening since then also yes both sides are talking and i would say that this is one of the good aspects of the relationship we have to keep channels of communication both at the diplomatic level and at the military level open but at the same time i am afraid i my view is that this is an inflection point in india china relations and we can discuss further what uh, the chinese are trying to say and signal uh, but this is an inflection point and that india will have to reassess its china policy and then recalibrate or reset its china policy let me stop there i think i've taken enough time no and and absolutely I, i i want to come to how we must do this recalibration because so many um uh, suggestions have come out in the last uh, few weeks um you have put it very bluntly and i think uh, the ministry of external affairs is also now saying that it is squarely putting the blame on china it is chinese actions uh, and the aggression they have shown um, and of course the fact that india has lost Uh, 20 soldiers we don't yet know how many uh, casualties the chinese side suffered on june 15 um is there an uh, easy answer and i know there isn't but i'm still going to ask you that question when uh, people look in surprise at what has happened particularly the the the, the deaths that uh, our army has suffered and ask why did china do this is this history geography uh, economic hegemony is it about xi jinping and prime minister modi is it just china's pure ambition sure so let me start by saying um sohasini you mentioned that i am very blunt uh, i am not in the government Thanks. anymore so i can be very blunt but also you know when i was in government and i was a diplomat i was also known for my directness and bluntness so let me start with that as a humorous aside uh, coming to the more serious situation on the ground itself um what i would say is that to this important question about why the chinese have done it uh there is a tactical reason and there is a strategic reason the tactical reason is purely to sit on territory which it believes and claims to be its own now why is that wrong why is changing the status quo wrong the answer to that is because there is no agreed boundary between india and china there is what is uh, called a line of actual control but even that it is not an agreed line of actual control whereas in the case of india and pakistan there is an agreed line of control so there is a big difference between these two borders and uh, therefore what the chinese have done this time is purely try to move their ground positions as i said earlier to what in their mind is uh, their lac now remember we do not agree to this conception of theirs of an lac and therefore built into this situation is uh, the potential for conflict uh, this is the tactical aspect of it the the strategic aspect of course and i think most of us in india should focus a little bit more on this is that if they were able to achieve and they have not been able to achieve what they set out to do if they had been able to do that they would have got the territory at on the cheap uh, but strategically what they are trying to indicate and signal is they are the biggest power in asia india should understand its place in this pecking order and this is a constant chinese refrain and theme throughout its history i think you know 
about this better than even I do. Uh, but uh, India should just accept its place uh, in, in, in the Asian pecking order. Now, on both counts, what the Indian army, what the Indian military has signaled is that we do not accept this. We do not agree with it. And therefore, what our soldiers have signaled on the ground now needs to be reinforced, signaled again, and uh, in, in a reset of our China policy. What that reset will be, I'll, I'll try to give you my views. I think a reassessment of Indian policy towards China needs to be broad based. Opposition political parties should be taken on board. Experts, military, diplomatic, uh, uh, you know, uh, scholars, academics should also be in, uh, asked for their views. Uh, but of course, this has to be a finite period of time. It cannot go on and on over years. Uh, it has sure. to be done. It has to be done quickly, and it has to be implemented before the end of 2020. Uh, right. We can we can go ahead and discuss what uh, the reset sure. policy should be. And I do want I, I do want to come to that, but you know you said something about the fact that China has this history and it wants to show where its place is. Uh, of course, China is guided uh, very much, I think, by uh, Mao's own statement of 100 years of humiliation and. This idea that it will not be hemmed in by the world ganging up on it once again, particularly Western powers as they see them. Um, however, uh, every once and now we have these skirmishes with China and then we have long periods where actually India and China try to refine each other, try to build ties. And one of the things that is constantly said to us, it was said to us before the Wuhan summit as well, it's been said to us by various prime ministers, uh, is that in fact India and China have fought only one war in the last 2000 years in 1962 even though there were these civilizations with these very very powerful kings and leaders over uh, over the centuries uh, we have not seen India and China actually go to war in fact the exchanges between India and China have been trade have been the silk route uh, there have been Sun Sang and, um, uh, you know, Indian scholars going to China. Uh, but we've not actually gone to war. So why do you think 2020 has changed that idea? And, and now people actively talk about the fact that China does want to contain India. Yeah. Um, so Asini, that's an excellent question. And uh, I'm at the end of whatever I have to say, I'm going to throw it back at you and ask you what your views are about it, uh, because you know a lot about this relationship too. But let me start by um, you know, trying to explain to our viewers and to our participants that there is a very important difference between India's civilizational ethos and China's civilizational ethos. Uh, you know, as all of you know, the Indian civilizational ethos is basically built around this concept which is called Vasudeva Kutumbakam, the world is one family. So our approach to the world is that you should be friends with the rest of the world, you should get on with the rest of the world, you should cooperate with the rest of the world and it even went to the extent where we were colonized by uh, you know other countries. On the flip side, the Chinese civilizational ethos I believe is summed up beautifully by the name of that country. In Chinese language, China is called Chungo, or as most of us interpret it as Middle Kingdom. So their approach to the world and to everything around them is that we are the center of the world and everything else revolves around us. The rest is all around us. We are the people who are at the center of the earth. So the Chinese are very self-absorbed. They are very um, you know, full of themselves. And uh, when they are strong, as they are currently are, then they are going to be challenging um, everyone across the globe, as we can see, uh, whether it's in the South China Sea on the India-China border or even uh, with Japan, the United States, etc. So uh, I, th I think uh, let me stop there and you know, throw this question back at you because what do you think is uh, is uh, yeah. this uh, particular? What is uh, the Chinese motivation for doing all this? 
Well, I, I, I would say, um, and, and you know, you've of course seen uh, also what happened in uh, Doklam a few years ago. I think there is a chafing at our line of actual control that is born as much out of uh, the ambitions in Beijing as it is out of the fact that, as many have pointed out, we are moving closer and closer to our LAC. We have made our LAC more accessible to our soldiers, to our people, um, uh, with infrastructure and, and um, uh, with bridges and, and you know, building roads towards that, and actually increased our own patrolling strength. And as you pointed out, the LAC has always been this kind of concept. Obviously, we know exactly where the LAC is, um, but the differences between the two have come into sharp focus in the last few years. Um, but I will say that, you know, we do have a way of turning China into uh, a dragon, um, which, you know, possibly China's rising ambitions have been a concern over the last two decades. Uh, it's not just uh, very recent. Uh, I, I mean, I remember reading Gordon Chang and the collapse, of the uh, coming collapse of China in 2000, where he has written exactly what people are saying today. And it didn't happen. You know, he spoke about the rise of China. He also spoke about how China's internal contradictions uh, would uh, would uh, topple the uh, the CCCP there in Egypt, you know in the in the near future. All of that did not happen. Um, but I do think that China is motivated by two or three things. One is an assertion of sovereign territory that has become something that has become a very important key part of Xi Jinping's presidency. Um, the second is uh, this idea that it will not allow itself to be ganged up against, uh, whether it's the Belt and Road Initiative, whether it has been uh, China's foray into the blue water economy and all the rest of it. Uh, there seems to be an outward thrust from China moving into the world, um, sending you know, their warships around the world to visit 100 countries a few years ago. And any attempt to hold it back in, I think, comes up against uh, comes up against a very sharp response, which is why I know that many have looked in wonderment uh, when it was suggested that uh, the our government's move on Article 370, the reorganization of uh, Jammu Kashmir and Ladakh, should not have concerned the Chinese at all because it's an internal reorganization. However, if you look at it from a Chinese prism, where they are a looking at our uh, reorganization of Ladakh in particular, uh, the way it could impinge on their connectivity to Pakistan, the fact that the China-Pakistan economic corridor is in fact moving through many of these areas that we are now claiming our assertions on after all. We made it very clear that POK, which includes Aksai Chin and Gilgit Baltistan, is something India will strive towards uh, bringing back. Um, these are things that do trigger situations inside Beijing. And the third uh, thing I will, I, I will just place over there is that every once, I think, a decade, there is a realization that America is a factor in this relationship. It was there in the 1950s. It went away um, because India took this non-aligned path. It came back uh, in the 1970s. It's, it's, it's a constant triangle that we grapple with. Uh, what it essentially means is that every time we work ourselves into what looks like a coalition with the U.S. against China, China will react. Now, we can say China cannot decide our friends for us, um, but there is a reaction. Uh, uh, I go back to January 2015, and I, uh, I, I think the moment President Obama came here and signed the joint vision statement on the Indo-Pacific, there was a reaction uh, from China. And that reaction was President Xi Jinping flying into Islamabad and signing uh, the CPEC agreement. Uh, he had cancelled his visit on a few occasions before that. But this then became the time uh, at which he went. Um, it is no coincidence that we see this kind of a situation uh, just after President Trump has visited India and has upgraded that joint vision statement on the Indo-Pacific and all the rest uh, that it is happening. But finally, uh, I would agree with you. There is something happening internally in Beijing, uh, which is allowing it to not only uh, push its its neighbors and and build its own kind of uh, uh, you know presence over there, but is allowing it to risk some of the most important relationships. You know, uh, something I I saw you uh, you gave an interview to the Hindu and and you said that China has given up 
a strategic relationship with India uh, in order to gain these tactical gains. That that is not the China that we've always studied about that has you know gamed twenty years in advance. So. Uh, I, I would like to ask you a little bit about that. If you could just unpack that idea that there was the possibility of a sure. better strategic tie with India, which has for the moment been completely yeah. jeopardized. Yeah. So let let me start with by saying that you know the current template or paradigm in which India-China relations have uh, been dealt with uh, on both sides uh, stems from. December 1998, uh, December 1988, when the then Prime Minister of India, Mr. Rajiv Gandhi, visited China, and that paradigm or that template is basically that the the border uh, resolution is important, but we continue to deal with that at one level, and we continue to deal with the whole architecture of maintaining peace on the border. And then, on the other hand, we can move ahead with the other aspects of the relationship, whether it is economic, whether it is cultural, whether it's education, whether it's tourism, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you can see that over the last uh, thirty decades, uh, over the last three decades, uh, the relationship has moved on this track. Unfortunately, we have now reached an inflection point because of two or three things. One, as you very correctly said, and I agree with you entirely. That the whole architecture of maintaining peace and tranquility has now fallen by the wayside because of the deaths which have taken place on both sides. Indian uh, soldiers, as well as many Chinese soldiers, have lost their lives in this clash at the Galwan River Valley, and therefore, uh, what we have signaled on the ground, what our military has signaled on the ground, that we will not be bullied. Uh, we will not just lie down and take this as uh, you wish. This message needs to be reconfirmed, restated through policy decisions that we take. And where we have maximum leverage, I believe, is on the economic side. Uh, so my suggestion to the government of India, and I don't know if it will take that suggestion. Others have also made it, is that we must ban Chinese firms from participating. In our 5G trials and rollout, that is something which will hurt them. It will hurt Huawei and ZTE, and that will send a solid message. I'm but sure there are other. That's not going to be a one-way uh, uh, decision. China will react to that as well, and sure, that could sure, affect our. Sure, um, sure absolutely. So, and and uh, uh, def definitely, it will. It there will be a reaction. Uh, but just as uh, we have signaled that we can take pain on the border, we need to signal very firmly and unambiguously that the people of India are behind this policy and can take pain, whether it's economic or otherwise. And I think unless we signal uh, strength, uh, we are not going to be able to resolve the boundary uh, in, in an equitable manner. Sure. So you're suggesting that not just military strength, we are going to need to Absolutely. show the anger of India, of the Indian people, in a sense. What do you think then of, of other suggestions that have been made? The boycott Chinese imports, the idea we heard from the uh, Hotel and Restaurant Association in Delhi who said, we will not allow Chinese nationals to live in Indian, in the hotels under their uh, jurisdiction. Do you think those are measures that are going to have an impact? Look, uh, my reaction to that uh, statement, that question, Suhasini, would be that, uh, you know, there is public anger right now. I don't know how long it's going to last. Um, but I, I think the policy reset needs to be done in a cool, calm, rational and calculated manner. So I, I would leave it to government in discussion with large swaths of society to come up with a package. As far as the boycott of goods is concerned, let me say that, you know, it's going to be difficult in today's day and age to have a blanket boycott of everything which is Chinese. But I believe here that the people of India could enter the diplomatic realm and could make, you know, decisions at the household level, which will reinforce our message at the strategic level. And I can give you a good example again of the telecom industry. 
if Indians decide to buy Samsung phones rather than Xiaomi and Oppo and Vivo, uh, that will send a loud and clear message about where are people, um, you know, uh, uh, their, their emotions and their feelings will be channeled in this way. Sure. How and, long and, it will last is anyone's yeah. guess, but I hope it is sustained. And I do see a lot of uh, social media talking about this idea. There is, however, uh, there are two hitches that I can see straight away, which is why, uh, in, you know, in a world that is much more interconnected than perhaps it was in, in, in 1962, uh, I do have to ask. The first thing is obviously the cost of Chinese goods, which is much lower than others. And sure. uh, the idea that people may enjoy the, you know, may actually like the rhetoric because it, it calms uh, people at a time when they are very angry. But in actual fact, if you have a choice between, you know, say, uh, um, uh, you know, an iron or a waffle iron or whatever, that is a thousand rupees uh, and buying uh, an Indian or an Italian thing that is two thousand rupees, you may make a, a different decision. The second place, and I think these are concerns that have been uh, already officially indicated by our exporters association is that they feel very strongly that their exports are going to get stopped reciprocally. Uh, as it is, there is this deficit between India and China. Uh, if Indian exports are completely stopped, that is going to have an impact on us. Uh, uh, we're also hearing about uh, the, the uh, if you like, the uh, casualties on the side in terms of goods that are coming from China, but maybe from other countries uh, that are being stopped now at our port. Do you think that an economic war of this kind uh, is sustainable over time? No, look, I am not at all um, recommending or suggesting that there be an economic war. Uh, I am not at all suggesting that there should be some kind of deep freeze between India and China. In fact, I'm rec recommending that there must be channels of communication between our two countries, diplomatic, and military and other channels of communication. So I'm not uh, saying that we should go back to a policy which was um, which was decided post the 1962 conflict. I'm not saying that at all. But at the same time, we should unambiguously indicate to policy changes we make, and there could be pushback uh, from China, and we will have to see how that works, and we can take it. But we have to show that we as a country uh, are not going to take things lying down and we are not going to uh, accede to Chinese hegemony. Uh, there will be pain. There will be economic pain. Uh, there is no doubt about that. But I think there is no gain without pain. And as a country, if we believe that we are going to, uh, you know, we are going to be tough with China, but don't want any sort of pain in terms of lower profits or higher prices, then I'm afraid that uh, that is not uh, what uh, I would uh, expect. I would think that uh, if you are emotional about it and if you feel strongly about it, you must also recognize that there will be some pain along with the strong message that you sent. So some of this pain has been absorbed very easily when it comes to India and Pakistan. And I know that you have, you have um, uh, served in both countries. Do you think there is a comparison between how India has over the last few years completely cut itself off from Pakistan, completely done away with trade ties, there are no uh, real, real exchanges, cultural exchanges, visas are at a low, um, and uh, we don't have, uh, we really actually don't have any ties except, the, you know, what is absolutely necessary between the two countries. Is that a possibility with China? Uh, no, I, I don't think so, because the situation of each of those countries is uh, radically different. And uh, with China, let me say that, you know, we have communications with the decision makers in China. On the other hand, I think with Pakistan, we don't have uh, interaction and, and uh, communication with the decision makers in Pakistan, which is basically the Pak army. Uh, so the, the, the two situations are entirely different. Uh, but uh, uh, but uh, to come back to your question, uh, I think that, you know, we need to send a strong message and uh, we'll have to take it on the chin uh, as our soldiers have done on the ground. Uh, and uh, they have uh, we have India as a country has sent a message 
on the ground militarily it needs to be backed up by policy decisions all right um in terms of what we know militarily at the lac and you've described the situation over there i do have to ask and i know that this is perhaps not the best time to ask it um yet we are now two months into a standoff was india caught napping were we taken by surprise were the was the wuhan summit and the mahabalipuram summit that followed uh, actually something that dulled our senses into believing that this kind of thing would not have happened no not at all in fact i think uh, you know uh, we have been tracking very closely what the chinese military has been doing uh we knew that they were in uh, this part of the world on their side uh, for military exercises uh, what they did was quickly divert those troops uh, to the uh, lac uh, and i don't think we were caught napping at all in fact i i don't i wonder why people ask this question uh, for the simple reason that even if you look at the galwan river valley we have stopped them at the lac and not let them come beyond that so i don't think we have been caught napping at all i think our military has given a very good account of itself including in the hand to hand combat on the night of the june uh, 15th where uh, in my uh, belief and there are no uh, confirmations of this uh, many chinese troops were also um, casualties and were killed in that hand to hand combat you're quite convinced of that a uh, 100% sure if china um, doesn't want to admit it that's their problem and you know and 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 india has of course uh, always uh, you know uh, honored its, its we we its, have uh, to we are an open situation. we are an open transparent society the bodies will go back to their homes so we have to uh, you know announce this and and also honor them as you rightly said we, we and we saw this situation with kargil it took pakistan years to in fact uh, absolutely admit, uh, its its nationals had died um Finally, I do want to ask the kind of because I I can see there are audience questions coming in, so I will turn to them next. Uh, the impact on neighboring countries. Clearly, we see Pakistan waiting in the wings, watching this situation between India and China, and in its own way making the point that India is at war with all its neighbors. Uh, we have an unexpected explosion in ties with Nepal, which totally uh, you know sidelined us. in fact uh, uh, completely took people by surprise while this entire stand off of china was continuing there are countries like bhutan where you have served which will watch very closely even if they say nothing and there are other like bangladesh sri lanka maldives who are closer to india traditionally but now have the balance of power when it comes to investment in those countries is all from china do you think any of them are looking at this stand off and uh, do you think they will change their mind about how they want to behave with india you you are absolutely right it's not only our neighbors it's the whole world who's looking at this standoff and i think they are looking very carefully to see how india handles the challenge which has been posed by the chinese military it it is uh, they are also looking at how india handles the larger strategic challenge which has been posed uh and uh, uh, depending on that you know how international relations shape up uh, will will also be decided upon you can see that uh, the democracies of the world like the united states which has already taken measures reported in today's uh, newspapers of moving uh, its of changing its force structure and moving troops uh, from uh, the european theater to the indo pacific theater you have seen how our relationship with australia has has uh, strengthened immeasurably uh, with japan of course it has always been very strong but to come back to the question of neighbors i, I don't think apart from uh, nepal which of course is a different kettle of fish uh, but i think our relationship with the rest of our neighbors is reasonably strong and good uh, yes they will be watching uh, but i think the strong and robust reply and response from india will also send its own message as far as nepal is concerned i'll only say one thing and i'm not an expert i know the problem at kalapani but uh, i i will only say one thing that i think that the nepalese polity has made the mistake of uh, pushing itself into a corner by passing a law and changing its maps etc etc uh, i think this is a corner from which they will find it very difficult to come out of because once you push yourself into a corner diplomatically 
it's almost impossible to get out of it so they have left no yeah. room for discussion negotiation etc but let's also make the point that nepal clearly did not feel its old and traditional ties with a country like india was a deterrent enough and it brings me to the question that uh, one of our participants has asked rachita uh, akhilesh johan asked with nepal towing behind china should we worry about bhutan as well uh well i can tell you that i have served in bhutan and therefore i know that country very well so hasani we have met in thimpu uh, uh, on occasions uh i don't think we have to worry about bhutan on on that front because i think the bhutanese see very clearly uh, that uh, um, they are sandwiched between two large civilizations and uh, uh, the threat to their own um a country their own way of life uh, comes not from the south but from the north so i think that is the, the 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 bhutanese have a very clear understanding of this it is a historical understanding and it continues to this day so and the neighbor I, to the I would south say being that, india yeah, i would say and and to come back to nepal i would also say that i think this is a result of domestic politics in nepal Uh, which has spilled over into the international relations area international uh, politics field uh, but i hope that uh, you know nepal also is able to see where its interest lies and, and where its uh, threat uh, perception lies this is there's another um, uh, more complex question from sachdev ramakrishna who says ambassador bombawale how does one comprehend modern day geopolitics where there is this territorial aggrandizement without global supervision so the idea that there is the decline of the us's interest in the world in a sense as a result of which china is pushing ahead in the south china sea nepal etc so the question he asks is is our foreign policy going in the right direction looking west looking east and looking everywhere mm. then is appropriate should should we in fact be putting our eggs into any one basket um that's an excellent question and let me say that you are absolutely right that some of what has happened including on the india china border this summer is the result of a a, a, a waning superpower and a rising new power uh and there is no doubt about that uh however th- we cannot write off the united states at all uh but to come back to what india should be doing i i think that you know foreign policy is an outworking of our own domestic uh, policies and i think we need to uh, focus laser sharp on what we need to be doing domestically because that is key to how india will respond to other challenges whether from china or any other country uh, and domestically there is no doubt that over the last 10 year period or uh, over the last 8 or 9 years there has been a secular decline in our gdp growth rate we have to pay attention to this we have to set the economics of india uh, right uh, if and to strengthen our uh, our economics if we have to get the geopolitics right and uh, and and be able to play a role in uh, international geopolitics so i i think you were hinting at this i couldn't agree more with uh, the question that was asked that a lot of answers to what uh, we do externally actually lie inside india and we okay. need to pay a lot of attention to it particularly in this post covid recovery period uh, economic recovery period all right um there's roini who's asking more about indian politics and says what are your comments i think what she means is uh, the rajiv gandhi foundation not uh, congress party accepting a donation from I think that was the Chinese MC in in 2012 also the idea that there have been these MOUs between parties do you think that the kind of uh, political fragmentation we've seen in the last couple of weeks is actually a cause for concern um i i don't know much about internal politics uh, swasini maybe you're better place to answer that question i'll only well, say that you know what's happened in the past is a result of what was the situation in the past let's not harp on it and try to bring it to the current situation because in current situations and in my experience whichever political party is in office does take reasonably strong decisions and tough decisions in the national interest so i that has been my experience as a civil servant 
I'm totally apolitical uh, today uh, and have always been. So uh, my experience of working with so many governments in office has been that all of them have always put the national interest first and taken decisions which they believed promoted India's interest. All right. Question from Satish Mudalayar, and this is an interesting one, which is that at, how do we counter the Chinese strategy of one step backwards and then two steps forward? I, I think, in, in effect, the, the two steps forward and then taking one step yeah. back is, is actually what they're doing, possibly trying to do at the LAC as well. No, absolutely, Mr. Mudalayar. Let me say very clearly that we will not permit them and we will should not permit them to take two steps forward, one step back. There is no question of that. And therefore, the bottom line in this particular standoff, uh, the bottom line as far as India is concerned, is restoration of the status quo ante, which means your forces go back to where they were before all this started in mid-April or end April or whatever date it started, and nothing short of that. So when there are new tents, when new encampments which are built by the Chinese, that is why we object to it, because one of the fundamental principles for maintaining peace and tranquility on the India-China border is no change in the status quo. Right. Um, here's another uh, question from Divya, who says, uh, what's actually what China was doing, simply a way of taking advantage of a country trying to cope with COVID? And it's interesting, the timing, in a sense, uh, we've almost forgotten about coronavirus as we, as we discussed this panel. Yeah. No, you, I think uh, you're right. Uh, I mean, the coronavirus and the fact that India is still battling the COVID-19 uh, and there are still, the, it's spreading uh, faster. Uh, the numbers are rising even today uh, is something which played well for the Chinese. But I believe that they probably started their uh, preparations for this much earlier before, uh, uh, you know, India, which was late in this whole cycle of COVID. Uh, was infected and affected by it. So um, to an extent, the fact that uh, COVID hit India and hit India quite uh, hard in terms of lockdown, in terms of infections, uh, played into uh, their hands. But as you can see that uh, the Indian armed forces were ready for such a thing and uh, they have actually stopped the Chinese PLA at the LAC and are trying to push them further back so that we restore status quo ante as it existed before all this started, which is possibly you can go back to April 15th of 2020. Which is essentially why many are predicting that if a disengagement does take place and we don't escalate the situation, uh, it could take months because what we are demanding is status quo ante, not just disengage from the standoff point. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Had, uh, absolutely. I, I think it, it could take... It could take months, it could take years, uh, okay. and India should be prepared for this. Um, and I think we have time for one more question. So, Rachita has another question, which is that in the Chinese security policy itself, there was no mention of India as a threat. Um, Vietnam has been mentioned, other countries are mentioned, uh, but India was not mentioned. Why is it that we see this uh, <laughs> reaction from China? Does it actually think of India as a threat? Look, Rachita, you have to understand that China is not the United States. In an open, transparent society like the United States, everything is put down in writing. In China, it is not. But why India is a possible potential threat to China is because of the fact that we are a large country in terms of area. We have a huge demography. Uh, we have an economy which is growing. Uh, though we need to pay special attention to it, as I said. And most importantly, we are achieving all this in a democratic setup. And therefore, if India succeeds and if India achieves its potential, it will prove the lie to what is referred to as the Beijing consensus or the China model of an authoritarian regime delivering faster economic progress to its people. And that is why India is a threat to uh, China in the long term, is a potential threat to China, let me say. And whether they write about it or speak about it or don't, don't go by that. It is not a transparent, open country like we are. And we should never make this mistake 
And this is why I spoke about the differences in our civilizational ethos and how it works out in, in practice on the ground. All right. Um, Ambassador Vibhama Wale, I'm really going to have to wrap it up over here and hand over to Sanjay Roy, but thank you. It's been uh, uh, certainly, uh, you know, uh, an education for us all, but the idea remains that the causes of what have, has happened is uh, are more strands than we perhaps have yet completely grasped. There's, you know, there is the current situation, there's historical, there's economic, and there's geographical as well. Um, and the response that India must build, according to what you have spoken of, has to, in fact, encompass them all. But thanks so much uh, for joining us, Sanjay. I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Sohasini. Thank you, Sohasini. Thank you, Ambassador. I think that was a really important session outside of the screaming and shouting that you tend to see on many television channels. You were able to really put, both of you were able to put this into perspective. I think we need to draw that line in the sand, as you rightly said, in many ways. A look at, you know, perhaps sending a message, as you've mentioned, especially the economic message. But we all know, again, as you said rightly, that to get the economic message out there, there will be pain. We have to take that on board. But we also have to stay the course, because I think in staying the course, whether it's Japan or South Korea or Taiwan or much of the pearl belt around us or the, or, or the pearl string of pearls around us that govern the Indian Ocean, uh, whether it's Sri Lanka or Maldives or Mauritius, everybody is looking to us, including Africa, where they've taken, as we know, checkbook diplomacy and just taken over much of that continent. So thank you for putting it into perspective. And so Asani, as usual, brilliant. And, you know, I wish this conversation could go on. And the, as you can see, the questions have continued to stream because this is obviously on the top of everybody's mind. And, you know, when you get into a television debate, which is so positioned, you don't have that option to go beyond the shouting and the screaming. This was a new answer. So thank you both very much. And thank you all for watching. I think much of what was said today is food for thought. Um, uh, the ambassador and Sarsini have both said that this needs to be considered. Uh, no knee-jerk reaction. Uh, we have to think through our strategy, and it has to be for the long term. And he does believe that governments, irrespective of their political cover, has color has always worked in the interest of the larger Indian people. Um, thank you, Red FM, our, um, our, our radio partners. And I do look forward to having you guys back on tomorrow. Remember, we've got two brilliant sessions. Ambassador Bambable talked about Nepal, and that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, we have Nepal unleashing the Vajra, Sujeev Shakya and Nafteet Sarna in conversation. Nepal and India are bound together by ties of history and common cultural heritage. A timely session with author and thought leader Sujeev Sakya from Nepal and writer and diplomat Ambassador Navdeet Sarna on the economic and geopolitical realities of the region and the need and impetus to reinforce the ties of friendship in these fraught times. This will be at 7.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 2.30 p.m. British Summer Time and 9.30 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. The second session tomorrow is, how can the sacred be sensuous? Vidya Dehejia in conversation with William Dalrymple. In the art of the Islam and Christianity, the sensuous is often seen to be opposed to the sacred, but this is certainly not the case in Hindu art. Vidya Dehejia, one of India's most engaging and distinguished art historians, who has written extensively on the body, love, and sensuality in Indian art, addresses the issue in conversation with William. This will be at 8.30 p.m. Indian Standard Time, 4 p.m. British Summer Time, and 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. See you on Saturday. Thank you again for watching.